anything you've heard so far or anything you hear during the lesson that you will let us know. We're going to continue our study of In Every Church in 1 Timothy 4. We're going to be in verse 7 this morning. If you remember the, the purpose of the lesson, we have been showing New Testament scriptures supporting Paul's claim that he preached the same thing in every church, 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 17. He says something similar in chapter 7 and, 7, and verse 17. We know that Paul was revealed, uh, the gospel was revealed to him, Galatians 1.12. We know that he was an inspired apostle. We know that he only taught the truth, Romans 15, 18. I dare not speak of any things save those which Christ wrought through me to make the Gentiles obedient in word and deed. We know that he only preached the truth. He only taught what God revealed and he taught it everywhere. And the result was one church everywhere. And so we always ask the question, if there's only one gospel, there's only one true New Testament teaching, why are there so many churches? And it's good when we have visitors and it's good when we have folks that aren't members of the church and when I say members of the church, I mean there's only one church. Acts 2 and verse 47. As Peter revealed the inspired word of God, the gospel to those on Pentecost, they were obedient to that gospel and they were forgiven of sin and added to the one and only church. Acts 2, 41 through 47. So why are there so many churches? Well, obviously that is a doctrine and a, a thing of man, not of God. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 33. Because God isn't the author of confusion and man is. So let's look at verse 7. 1 Corinthians, or 1 Timothy 4. Paul would say to Timothy, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Now when we see a word like but, we, it causes us a little bit of concern because we need some information, don't we? So let's look back at the first six verses of this chapter to make sure that we understand what is being said. Paul says, the Spirit speaketh expressly, that is plainly, that in latter times some shall depart from the faith. That is the system of faith, the gospel. Some shall depart from the gospel. There's only one system of faith and some will depart from it. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devil. Wait a minute. I just saw something the other day on somebody's post on Facebook that says once you're saved by God's grace, you're always saved by God's grace. But Paul says, in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. They were in the faith, and now they're not in the faith, right? They have departed from it. You can't depart from something that you've never been in. I can't depart from the podium if I was never on the podium. You can't depart from the building if you're never in the building. They were in the faith. They were part of the faith. They were part of New Testament Christianity. They were practicing New Testament Christianity, but at some point, they would depart from it. Galatians 5.4 says... That if you seek to be circumcised or if you seek to keep the law, then you are fallen from grace. That's the same concept. How, were, how, did they, how did they depart from the truth? Well, they gave heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. When you hear these words, don't, don't think of, oh, some evil spirit came and spoke to them. No, no, no. That is the spirit of man. That is, they gave heed to false teachers who understood that some folks wanted their ears scratched and they would scratch them. Speaking lies and hypocrisy. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, that is forbidding those who are scripturally eligible to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which know and believe the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus. Timothy could be a good preacher. A good servant of Christ, if he put folks in memory of these things. If he reminded them of God's will in their lives, right? In every aspect. Anybody know any good preachers? I know a few. You know what they do? Preach the word. 2 Timothy 4. Preach the word. Be urgent in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure the sound doctrine, but having itching ears will heap unto themselves teachers after their own lusts and will turn their ears aside from the truth and turn unto fables. A real gospel preacher preaches the gospel and the gospel only. He does so faithfully. He doesn't articulate his thoughts and his, his opinions. He articulates the word of God. And Timothy would be the same thing. You'll be a good servant if you do these things. Nourished up in the words of faith, 
and good doctrine. If there's good doctrine, there's also bad doctrine. And they would be nourished up in the faith and in good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained or followed. Timothy knew what to preach. And Paul is telling him that. So, when we say but, we need to understand this, this context behind us in the previous six verses, all right? Refuse. To refuse is to reject. Let me ask you a question. Is it okay to reject some things religiously? Is it mean spirit? Oh, you're being ugly. You can't do that. Number one, do we have a right to reject something religi religiously? Yes or no? You can nod if you'd like or shake your head. Yes, we have a right to reject something religiously, don't we? Yes. Now let me ask you this. Is it according to our standard? No. Whose standard? God's. You know, in Matthew chapter 7, it's one of the most famous verses in the world. In verse 1, and they don't bother to go a few more, a few more verses. Judge not, lest ye be judged. But you know, there's more to it than that. He goes on to say, you will be judged with whatever judgment you give. If you are a hypocrite, that is, you got a big old light pole in your eye and you're trying to get the little tiny toothpick out of your brother's eye, you better judge yourself first. Then you can see clearly to judge your brother. It's obvious that there must be judgment, but what is a righteous judgment, John 7, 24? Jesus tells the Pharisees and the folks in that text, judge ye not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. What is righteous judgment? Righteous judgment is with a pure motive. Uh, Ephesians 4.15, that is love. Righteous judgment is according to a, the pure standard. That is God's inspired word, John 12.48. So if we have the right motive and the right standard, we can judge righteously. So I ask the question, is it okay to refuse or reject some things in matters of religion? Yes or no? So if the Mormons come to your house and knock on your door and say, I want to study with you, and you will let them in and you're studying with them, and they say, why don't you become a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? Is it okay to say no? It's not only okay, it's right to say no, right? Say, how about you become a member of the church by putting away that error and coming into truth? Is it okay to reject that, yes or no? Yes, of course it is. Is it okay to reject uh, the teachings of Islam? Of course it is. Is it okay to, to reject the teachings of Oriental mysticism and Buddhism? Of course it is. So it is okay for us to reject some things religiously, right? And we have to make a judgment to do so. Notice what Paul would say to Titus in Titus 3.10. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject. Is it okay to reject someone at certain times? Yes or no? Church discipline. Anybody ever heard of it? Matthew 18 has church discipline. Did you know that there's a famous word, a verse out there in Matthew 18 and says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am in the midst of them. You know, almost everybody thinks that's worship. That's not worship. That's in judgment. That's in discipline. In other words, if a brother sins against me and I go to this brother and I say, hey, you did this to me, um, why don't you repent of that so that I can forgive you? No, I'm not going to. Then you take, uh, take another one or two with me. And we go to the brother and we try to, to bring about repentance. No, I'm not doing it. Then we bring it before the church. And guess what? If he refuses to hear the church, what does it say? Reject him. You are to withdraw yourself from him. He is, to be, he is to be admonished as a brother, as would be said. But he is in the error and he needs to know he's in error. Sometimes you have to withdraw yourself from these people. There are folks that we have as a congregation withdrawn fellowship from because of them practicing error continually after repeated attempts to get them to repent and they wouldn't do it, right? At some point, the Bible says you have to. And guess what? In Bible study this morning, we talked about whether Christians can be self-willed or God-willed. And guess what? When I come to the fork in the road and I say after repeated attempts to study, after a year of patience, what do we do? God's will or what we think we should do? God's will. And God's will says that we are to put away these folks from us. We are to withdraw ourselves, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. And we are to mark these people and avoid them and do our very best to bring about a change. But we are not to fellowship them. And things are different between us now, right? That's their choice. That's not ours. We don't have a choice. We've got to do it God's way. Everybody get that? If, if there's any questions, I'll be back in the back, okay? If there's any disagreements, I'll be back there. Certain people should be rejected at certain times. Now, I'm going to tell you something else. Nobody likes discipline when it comes to church discipline, do you? Is anybody uh, relish the thought of going and confronting a brother about error? I don't. Does anybody look forward to having a meeting about uh, uh, teaching or, or meeting with someone and studying with them because they are currently engaging in sin in a congregation? 
I wouldn't look forward to that. Is anybody looking forward to the congregation coming together or the men or the elders talking about withdrawal of fellowship from someone because of their constant error? I'm not, I wouldn't look forward to that. Nobody likes that, right? But we need to understand that some folks at certain times, and that's as a last resort, we've got to follow God's will. Certain folks must be rejected at certain times, all right? Certain things must be rejected at certain times. I know thy works, Revelation 2 and verse 2. And thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them that are, uh, which are evil, and hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them to be liars. You can test a person. You can test doctrine, right? We can test these things. Is it okay to, uh, who is that guy that I was watching that time and there's a commercial came on? Peter Popoff. Peter Popoff. He's on TV and he'll sell you a miracle blank, a miracle handkerchief or miracle water. I got a handkerchief in the mail from a guy the other day and it was uh, used out of uh, the book of Acts where Paul, they would uh, bring him handkerchiefs and he would touch the handkerchiefs and it would heal them of their maladies. And he says, now here's the handkerchief, but if you sow a seed gift, it'll really bless you. So what I was supposed to do was write out a check and send it back to him so that I could get some fake blessing. Right? Is it okay to test these people and to show that they're liars? Yeah. Do you know that Jesus in Revelation 2 2 commended a congregation for proving that these folks were lying? Did you know that? That's okay. It's okay for us to reject false teaching, it's okay for us to reject false teachers. We can't associate with certain people or certain things. Ephesians 5 11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So, whenever. Defuniac has a national day of prayer and everybody gathers around the lake yard. Do you like the fact that there are people thinking about religious things? Yes. Is it okay for us as New Testament Christians to go and participate with these people who are practicing error? No. Is it okay for us to try to go and teach them? Sure. But don't participate with them. We can't. And there are a lot of folks who don't understand that. And I'm sorry you don't understand that. But I will tell you this. Same chapter in Ephesians 5 and verse 17. It says, Wherefore be ye not foolish. But understand the will of the Lord. If you don't understand this concept, you can. Okay? Number one, you can understand it. But it might take a little bit of change from you. You might want to open your mind just a little bit and understand that God knows better than you. And you might want to actually take a little bit of time and effort and study. And if you do that, you'll come to the same conclusion because that's what God says. If we really love somebody, and I, I, I said this the other day on a public, uh, on Facebook. If I really love someone in sin, what am I going to do? You want my analogy again? It's been a while, all right? Oh, brother so-and-so is sleepwalking. You know, he has, he has narcolepsy. Isn't that what that is? You fall asleep all the time, and then he actually starts walking in his sleep. And he's walking towards the old, uh, the old uh, uh, cliff. And if I really love him, what am I going to do? Pat him on the back and say, hey, brother, have a nice time. Or am I going to say, hey, wake up. What are you doing? Right? Warning him. Ezekiel 3.18, warn those, warn the wicked of his wicked way. If I love you and you're doing wrong, what should I do to you? Warn you. That doesn't mean be ugly, does it? No, 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 no. It means, hey, think about this, please. This is what you're doing now. Please understand this isn't right. Let's study it. God loves you. He gave his son for you. He wants you to change, but it's up to you. Right? No, we don't hate people that practice sin. But we should hate the sin. We should despise the sin. We should hate it enough to do something about it and never even want to be around it. I, I'm not going to practice this, and I can't be around anyone that does practice this. I've got to try to bring about a change. You've got to change. If I love you, I'm looking out for your best interest. True? So I'll give you another analogy. This is a little easier to understand. If you've got a little kid, a little, little youngin, you're going to let him go play in the road because he wants to, right? Well, that's what he wants to do. How, who are you to tell him no? Oh, your mama. Or your daddy and you got sense, don't you? And you're going to tell that little boy or little girl who doesn't even realize they're in danger, you can't do that. Right? That's not unloving. That's actually being loving. That's being a parent. That's doing what you're supposed to do. Now, these dummies that let their kids go play in the road, obviously, they don't care about their kids. The same could be true of, of folks who have friends and associates and loved ones that are practicing sin. Oh, my, my brother, my sister, my mom, my dad, they're practicing homosexuals. Oh, I just love them. And just, oh, I think it's great. So you're going to love them all the way to hell. So instead of saying, hey, don't you understand this is wrong? 
please let's study this and think about it together. I don't want you to be lost forever. I want you to change. That's unloving. No, actually you've got it wrong. I'm the loving one whenever I try to bring about a change. And if you don't care enough about the souls of people to let them go into hell without saying a word to them, you don't love them. And I'll be right back there again if you've got a disagreement. Bring some Bible with you. Let's talk about it. Okay? I don't want to hear I think or I feel. I want to hear what God says. God says if you love the wicked, you will warn the wicked. Ezekiel 3. Okay? Again, don't mistake warning with hating. Obviously, if I hate you, I'll never say a word to you. You remember what uh, the book of Leviticus said? Thou shalt no wise, uh, in no wise hate thy neighbor in thine heart. Thou shalt not suffer sin upon him. In other words, I'm not going to allow my neighbor to just participate in all this unrepentant sin without ever saying a word to him. If I do, I hate his guts. Right? All you got to do to hate somebody is do nothing. But if you're really concerned for their well-being, you're going to do something. You get it. Right? Everybody gets it. It's just we don't like it. Well, that's on you. But refuse. We are to refuse certain, certain things. What should we refuse? Well, what about profane babblings? Profane things. Profane, it is, the Greek word says, a threshold. Accessible as by crossing a doorway. In other words, you've gone too far. You've gone beyond. Right? You are a heathenish, wicked, profane person. 1 Timothy 1.9 Knowing this, that the law was not made for a righteous man. Why? Why is it the law made for a righteous man? Because a righteous man isn't going to steal from their neighbor anyway. A righteous man isn't going to covet his neighbor's wife anyway. A righteous man isn't going to steal you or hit you in the head and take your cow. He's not going to take you into custody and sell you to someone as a slave. He's not going to murder you, is he? Because he's a righteous man. But it was made for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers. So you see profane is thrown in among all these other things. You get the idea. 1 Timothy 6.20 O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science so uh, falsely so called. Hebrews 12.16 Lest there be any fornicator or profane person. You know why Esau was profane? Why? We went over Genesis in, in Wednesday nights. You know why, Genesis, uh, why Esau was profane? Because he sold his birthright. Why? Oh man, I'm so hungry. I've got a carnal physical appetite, and I'm so hungry, I, I'm not using my, my birthright. What do I care? I want something now. I want to appease my carnal appetite right now, and I don't care what it costs. That's profane. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? People today throwing their eternal souls away for pleasures of this life. That, by definition, is profane. Old wives' fables. Silly tales, in other words. Timothy was to refuse profane and silly tales. 1 Timothy 1.4 Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith. Romans 10 and verse 8 The soul-saving gospel is the word of faith. It is the standard of judgment. Romans 2.16 Not old wives' fables. The opinions of men mean nothing to us in the long run. Nothing. 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For we, uh, he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We also have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well to take heed, as unto a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but by holy men of God. They spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The inspired word of God is sufficient for me to learn about Jesus. I don't need your opinions. I don't need the old wives' tales. Oh, let me tell you this story that happened. I don't need it. If you want to make an analogy to make a spiritual point, that's one thing. But I don't need your opinions or your thoughts. I need God's Word. God's Word is sufficient to prepare me for eternity. Period. Alright? I don't need anything else. 
Exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Rather than worrying about the ignorance of men, we should be practicing righteousness. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Christ as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. That's what we ought to be doing, to make a practice of righteousness. In Romans 6, beginning in verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is free from sin, uh, is, he is dead, is free from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we should also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God through Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Isn't that, isn't that what we're just talking about? Someone who is practicing this kind of thing, a living in a sinful situation. Oh, you know what? I just can't help fornicating. I don't know what it is. I just can't help it. I'm just addicted to it. Yes, you can help it. You better not do it. You can't obey that. You can't do it. And if I'm doing that, folks, you've got an obligation. If you love me, you've got an obligation to me. Eric, this isn't right. If you love me, do you want me to go to heaven? Everybody can shake. I can see you. If you love me, you want me to go to heaven? Yes. And if I'm doing something you know is wrong, and if you love me, shouldn't you tell me? But you know what that does? That conflicts with the world's opinion. Well, let me tell you something. I don't care about the world's opinion. I care about what God says. And God says, if I love someone, I'm going to tell them the truth because I want them to be saved. Right? That's what we want. All right? Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness. How can I possibly yield my member, my body, as an instrument to righteousness if I'm practicing some terrible thing? Oh, I can't. But I can do one or the other. So I have to make a decision at some point. Oh, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. And I'm going to live for God. Those who do so will be made manifest. You know what that means? You'll be made aware. It, it'll be visible for all to see. First John 3, beginning in verse 3. And every man that hath this hope in himself purifies himself, even as he that is God is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresses the law, for sin is transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifest to take away our sin, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sins not. That's, con that's synonymous with 1 John 1, 6 through 10. Walking in the light. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. Look at verse 10. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Let me ask you a question. It's a, it's a big one. You ready? It's a tough one. Do those who practice sin, are they doing righteousness? Yes or no? Those who are fornicating. Yes or no? Homosexuality. Yes or no? Thievery, yes or no? Okay, we're getting it, right? You can't practice these things, and if you practice unrighteousness, it says you are not of God. The Bible is very plain on these things. There's no gray area like the world wants to paint a picture of. It's right and wrong. And it isn't right to accept someone or tolerate someone just as they are just because the world says so. It's right that if we love someone, we want the best for them. You know I'm right. It's about time we start disagreeing with the world. Okay? Because that, that which is pleasing to the world is abomination to God. Alright? We need to start getting with it. And standing up. Because we love folks. Do you know why I want to try to bring about a change in the folks that are doing these things? Because I don't want them to be lost. Do you understand that's my motivation? I don't, I don't want to argue. I don't want to be seen of men. I'm not doing it for money. I'm not doing it for these things. I'm doing it because I want souls to be saved. I love my Lord, and I know my Lord loves these folks, therefore I love these folks, and I want them to be saved. Don't you? But we're not going to save them by tolerating it. Oh, it's fine. I don't see what's wrong with it. It's perfectly fine. It's not fine. The Bible says so. I'd like to take this opportunity to give one more thought. James 1. There is one 
rule, one law, James 1.25, in our eyes or in our minds that is profitable to man. And Paul in this text, in 1 Timothy 4.7, he makes it manifest. He gives you a contrast. There are the fables of men or the truth of God. And they're both not right. James 1.25, wherefore lay apart, or excuse me, James 1 beginning of verse 21, wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness. Listen, this is part of it. Everybody listen to me, please. Everybody paying attention right now? Listen. Receive with meekness. Oh, I already know. Hey, I'm a grown up. I'm big. I got a big old brain. I know what I know. You don't. Okay? Yeah, you may be a grown up. You may have a big old brain, but you don't know what's best for you. Listen. How about exercising some humility? Receive with meekness. Understand that God's word is truth. All you got to do is test it. Why don't you just take the time and test it and then come to the conclusion that it's truth? And then listen to it meekly, right? You're, you're meekly doing this. You're, you're doing it with humility. Look, God, I know you know better than I do, so why don't you teach me? Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholds himself and goes his way, and straightway he forgets what manner of man he is. But whoso looketh in the perfect law of liberty, and continues therein, being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Do you want to go to heaven? Yes or no? Do you want others to go? Yes or no? then we got to do something about it. we got to do as Paul instructed Timothy. We've got to review certain things and obligate those things that God obligated. And we do so because we love people. That's our motive. We speak the truth because we love souls. I'd like to take this opportunity to extend the invitation. Are there any here this morning that have never obeyed the gospel? If you've never obeyed the gospel, you must hear the word of God. Romans 10.8. You must believe it. John 19.35, we can believe in Jesus through his inspired word. We must repent of our sins. Acts 17.30, repentance is a change in mind. I change my mind about thinking about these things. I'll never do them again, and then I change my actions. I must confess Christ before men, Romans 10.10, 10, and I must be baptized for the remission of sins. Folks, when you are immersed in water for the remission of your sins, based upon these truths, you're forgiven of all sins, and you're added to the one church. And all you have to do then is be faithful. Live your life for God. You must open the Bible. And read it and understand his will in your life. And then you must do it. For those who have obeyed the gospel, if you're not faithful, there is a, a pardon for you also. That is, acknowledge your sin in prayer to God. Repent. He'll forgive you. If you need our prayers for you, we'll offer them and God will forgive if you're willing to repent. We're going to sing an invitation song as we do. If any have need, the invitation is yours. Please come now as we stand and sing.